Yes, Richard, I have heard your intro for me a few times, and um, I like it every time, so thank you for that. Um, and thank you, Lorna, for inviting me to read with you. We've been Yay. wanting to for some time now. Five years. Five years now, so now we're finally reading together. Um, so, yes, as Richard said, uh, Diwatha is a Tagalog word, which generally means spirit. Um, generally a spirit that lives in nature. So it's, um, you know, uh, pre-colonial times, uh, the Philippines uh, was mostly an animistic culture, or cultures, plural, and so there could be diwata of the trees, diwata of the forest, of the ocean, of the river, of the seas. And um, another uh, more obscure uh, definition or translation of diwata is muse, and that's one of the, uh, that's one of the translations that interests me the most as a poet. I've always wanted to know as a, as a woman poet who, you know, who gets to be my muse, right? Who do I get to go to? Um, and so this diwatha comes into play. I've been thinking about who my muses are, um, and they aren't so ethereal as, as I thought that they were going to be. They're mostly folks who are my ancestors, right? The elders in my family told amazing stories, and, um, you know, and, and as they started to grow old and pass away, it, it made me very sad to think their stories were going to possibly die too. So in my like second or third round of revisions, I started just writing like frantic um, some of the stories that I remembered from, from my grandfather who did pass away at the age of 94, quietly. Yeah. So, um, so that's Diwata, and um, I should also say that the creation story for, uh, the Tagalog creation story uh, starts this book alongside Adam and Eve. And in the Tagalog creation story, a bamboo grows, and a mischievous bird that's been starting a war between uh, sky and sea, um, pecks the bamboo open, and man and woman emerge together. So I've always liked that version of, of creation much better than being made from a man's rib. <laughs> so this is the bamboo's insomnia. I can't sleep. There's a poet stuck between the love lines of my palms. And I would tell her to get out if I could. But there is a poet stuck inside the cradle of my bones and tendons. Again, she tells the first story. Once when there was no light, the wind danced with the sea whose glassy surface became untamed funnels and silver-crested waves as she leapt and spun. The wind also spun and let out a mighty roar. You've heard this one before, no? How earth convulsed as if laughing. How seafloor forced her, her fingertips skyward how she freed her body from the silent, murky depths. She who was born of the rocks fell in love with the one who was born of sea spume. There upon the rocks, they, set, they spread seeds and soil, and from these, the bamboo sprouted. It rooted itself in those rocks, and some say lightning, some say a bird split this bamboo open. Others say a great serpent ruled the sea and set upon his crown a gleaming stone upon which the sky folk spilled dark earth. I do not know why they tried to bury the serpent, but because of this, he hissed and lashed at them. The sea was once sweet and cool as rainwater. In the north, the medicine woman told us of her people's prayers for salt. Hot winds brought to them fragrances of the dead. After the waters receded, the shores became the color of clear crystals and blood. Iha, I bring the sea, tobacco leaves, and fruit, but still no stories come to me. I plead with her, O oh, Diwata, please accept this offering. O oh, Diwata, to hear your words is all I ask. Today, as ever, she gives me but silence. Okay, I'm going to move over to the... Uh, uh, Diwata of the river, and uh, these poems are called Duyom, which is an Indo-Malay word for uh, mermaid, but also for the sea cow or the dugong. Um, 
And my grandfather lived in a house right on the uh, banks of the Cagayan River, up north, 12 hours north of Manila by bus. And the folks that lived in his village, um, you know, my aunt used to say, don't go down to the river, there's a mermaid there. And so I used to just kind of pester the boys that lived there to ask them, tell me about this mermaid, tell me about this mermaid, is she beautiful? And they wouldn't talk about her, you know, they just, nope, nope, nope. And then finally, after just weeks of, well, more like days of, of kind of plying them with, with, you know, rum and tobacco and stuff, they finally <laughs> said, no, nope, there's no mermaid there anymore. She's gone. And I was like, that means she used to be there. Where did she go? So, um, you know, they wouldn't tell me. And so I just kind of had to make up my own stories. Do we own one? At midnight, the old men gather with oil lanterns aboard their fishing boats. This is when I feed. With rosaries in hand, they stab the water with machetes. Their sons say, do not be foolish. There are no more mermaids here. It's the crocodiles who are stealing our brothers. Crocodiles, ridiculous. Crocodiles are not slick. My dolphin skin withstands the men's machetes, but make no mistake. The old men give me many scars. From tangles of nets in the shallows, the old men cut me loose. They pray I may quickly find open sea, but do not think this is kindness. Now as for their sons, their bodies come slipping deep into my home, hands and feet bound. Salvaged bodies full of soldiers' bullets, blooming blood flowers in my water. I sing them to sleep in my garden, if the old men only knew what care I take, bedding the sleeping sons of fishermen, warming their bodies in blankets of mud. Dragonflies. Behind the laughing house, the path is a sudden steep slide to the riverbank, and there are no stones along its path. Young ladies, don't go to the young ladies, don't go to the river on once a young lady slid down the steep path and into the water. When she returned, her hair was a nest of mud and blue baby dragonflies. She tittered constantly and touched her puckered lips with the tips of her wet fingers. She couldn't speak otherwise, fevered and whirring as she was. She stroked her throat and flicked her hair. She pulled open her thin blouse and exposed her tiny breast to the village boys. The handsome man in the laughing house stepped outside his door to see what was the commotion. Old church mothers clucked. She shouldn't have been standing so close, as young boys learned to kick the dirt and crow. The man shook his head at them all. He covered this young lady's body with his white coat, placed a cool stethoscope against her burning skin, and found inside her heart the thrumming of the river. There's a mermaid in the river behind the laughing house. She's the kind of mermaid who grabs at the ankles of young fishermen. The older one's legs are too sturdy. She pulls the youngsters into the cool water. She slides her body against theirs. They too surface crowned with blue baby dragonflies and the river rushing inside their hearts. The old mothers clutch their rosary beads. The river didn't used to be this close to the laughing house. One day, the river started to stretch itself wider and wider. The house started to throw stones and cough up so much dust. Tickled by its own dust, it giggled and it shook. The goats knocked over trees with their hooves and the flat tops of their heads. They fed upon the roots until the trees all withered and the soil gave way underfoot. Even the dragonflies ate grass blades one by one. The river, the house, the goats, the dragonflies, they did these things much to the old mother's dismay because the mermaid wanted to see the face of the godless handsome man who lived inside the laughing house. And I call it the laughing house because I swear to God, every time I would go upstairs in my grandfather's house, it would change configuration. And um, I'm a rational adult now, so it doesn't do that to me anymore, but I checked in with my cousin who's about a couple years younger than me, and he's a doctor, and he practices up in like Wyoming or something, and I said, 
bachelor to the house, like do this weird shape shifting thing on you when you were little. And uh, he said, yeah, it kind of did. Every time I went upstairs, the hallway went somewhere else. So, <sighs> alas, when you outgrow the stories, right? Okay, um, let's see. I'm gonna end Diwata with a poem about my Lola Elon, who was my mother's mother's spinster sister who didn't speak a word of English. A little bit about Lola Elon. During the war, the old women would still go outside the house to smoke their hand-rolled tobacco after cleaning the suppertime dishes. But so the Japanese soldiers would not see them, they learned to flip their cigarettes with the lit ends inside their mouths. They flipped their cigarettes with their tongues so fast and we kids would try to copy them. We burned our own tongues trying. Lola Ilang would do this, and I tried to copy her. It hurt. It hurt so much when I burned my tongue. Yes, Lola Ilang used to cook the best pochero, and foreigners thought it was a little weird to cook banana with bok choy. You used the saba banana. No other kind is sweet enough. Do you know, when she died, everyone had already forgotten how old she was. We had asked her some years ago, and even she had forgotten. But I was saying about the war. No, the women did not want the soldiers to find them. You know what the soldiers did to the women here. The Japanese buried so much gold in our hills. This is because our northernmost provinces were the last places they set foot before the ships left, after their emperor surrendered. They stole this gold, Spanish gold, from our churches. You know, not too long ago, some of the Japanese who had gone into hiding were found in the hills. They were so old, they never knew how the war ended. That too is a true story. I thought that was just something that my grandfather told me pulling my leg, but other people have told me that, you know, in Guam or on um, the island of Saipan, literally Japanese men were coming out of the hills and been there for decades going, what year is it? So that's a trip. That's a trip to me. Um, okay, so I'm going to read a little bit from um, Poeta in San Francisco, and um, it basically starts, uh, the book starts, and the encounter starts on the corner of 16th and Valencia in the mission. And the mission is uh, the first place in this country where my parents lived, so I consider that the beginning of my life in, <laughs> in the States. Um, the mission is where I was conceived. I was born in Manila. Um, and, um, but then, you know, it, it, um, it takes me back to how it is we even got there in the first place, you know, and, and, um, I, and, and I had had a very unpleasant encounter with, with a homeless man who happened to be a Vietnam vet, and I thought, well, now this is a really interesting interaction. How is it that he and I have come to this corner to have this volatile, volatile interaction? And so that got me to write this. Ave Maria. Although this takes place in the North Beach, I guess. Ave Maria. Our Lady who crushes serpents, Our Lady of Lamentation, Our Lady full of grace, whose weeping statues bleed, Our Lady who makes the sun dance, pray for us. Our Lady of salt pilgrimage, Our Lady of building demolition, Our Lady of crack houses, Santa Maria, Madre de Dios, pray for us sinners. Our Lady of Unbroken Hymen, preteen vessel of God's seed, your uterus is a blessed receptacle. Our Lady of Neon Strip Joints, Our Lady of Blowjobs in Kerouac Alley, Our Lady of Tricked Out Street Kids, pray for us. Blessed Mother of Cholo Tattoos, you are the tightest homegirl. Our Lady of Filas and Lip Liner, Our Lady of Viernes Santo Procession, Our Lady of Garbage Sifting Toothless Men, our Lady of Urban Renewal's Blight. Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Ipanalangin niyo kaming makasalanan, ngayon at kung kami ay mamamatay. Amen. Okay. The Siren Story. She wasn't born in this city. She found its basalt green stone chunks seafloor forced skyward. 
It found her hands through mist and odors, whirring, pigeons, club feet fluttering, toothless men's paper sacks spilling, elixirs, roots, shark fin tonics. Heat swelling, sewer steam rising, side street chess match maneuvers mystifying. It sought her whirlwind hair, grown sea vine thick. Songbird adrift, nestling neon, she crafted snares for moths, butterflies, treasure hunting children, tracing ideographs of sky and sun. Katina spires, smirking dragon boys, humming silk lanterns. Flight of phoenixes through fish vendor stalls. Corrugated plastic blackbird perches, jade ringed gardens, needle tipped shanties. It bulleted trees lighting hash pipes, herbalist storefront canopies concealing leather men versed in the language of whiskered ghosts. It invented her dialect carving tongue, salt fables, yellow caution tape palaces. She lost herself in this city. It lured her, drank her air. Honey voices precision, hybrid beyond memory. Songbird adrift, the city's misplaced siren. Migration patterns, subterranean streams swallowed whole. Okay, and one more poem from Poeta. This is the assumption. She lay down on the train tracks, brown girl, maybe 17, sparkly shoelaces, all that was left. Girlfriend wasn't doing no drugs, just gave up his all. The morning paper reported a suicide. Filipina crack whore, nothing to live for. Okay. And um, I will end with a couple of pieces from a chapbook that is uh, due out in uh, summer from uh, Aslan Libre Press. So I'm thrilled to be a part of this, you know, this new Chicano press. Um, you know, I asked, you know, you know I'm Filipino, right? Yes, of course. Um, these are the ways we build community with poetry. And let's consider this a response to our assumption poem. No, I am not yours. After Bob Kaufman's, I too know what I am not. No, I am not Vaseline smile of working girls singing through gritted teeth. No, I am not your sorry stepchildren hiding in corrugated metal boxes. No, I am not ghost of the assassinated senator locked in his crucifix pose. No, I am not wheezing of Manila's wily pickpockets in broken shoes. No, I am not monsoon fruit of oriental flesh tenders with skanky lingerie. No, I am not worship of sacred blue passport in hallowed INS halls. No, I am not crack pipe hopes of hopeless street walkers, traffickers, and legs spread wide. No, I am not garbage dump litanies of devout Catholics in crowns of alcoholic prayer. No, I am not chlorine bleach size of silent toilet scrubbers in unventilated gasps. No, I am not kisses of syphilitic sex vendors smiling through antibiotic lips. No, I am not illiterate workers' minimum wage sunk, sunk in this slumlord hell. No, I am not cry of newspaper pigeon winged trash in flight from leaf blower bullets. No, I am not rails of avian flu amplified by tobacco addiction. No, I am not stumble of broken English inarticulate in racist America. No, I am not report of silenced women helpless in the soldier's disease. No, I am not reflection of your darker self alone in the almighty dollar. No, I am not wombs of Filipina maids hatching more Filipina maids. No, I am not the whistle of street corner whores with cribs of hungry mouths. No, I am not curse of immigrant children bent under broken parents. No, I am not kiss of tropical breeze, unconditional Penai love. No, I am not the aping of you escaped from your captivity. No, I am not anything that is anything I am not. Okay, let's see. Um, I'm going to uh, maybe like what? Two more poems? Two, two, two more poems? Sure. Oh, okay. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so this poem I wrote after uh, Lee Herrick, who's a Korean-American poet, mm -hmm. uh, Korean-American.
an adoptee poet from Fresno, Fresno, and he's got this wonderful poem called My California, which is published in a, a recent issue of Ziziba. And so, um, you know, when I, I don't know what to write, I just steal other people's stuff. So this is My California after Lee Herrick's My California, after Lee Herrick's California. And it begins with an epigraph. Let me serenade the streets of LA from Oakland to Sacktown, the Bay Area, and back down. That's from Tupac's California Love featuring Dr. Dre. In my California, we Wild Wild West. We Gold Rush Fabulous. We Watsonville Carabao. We Morro Bay Rock. We Walnut Grove Boogie. We Broccoli Bebop. We Tule Lake. We Manzanar. We Poema in Espanol. We stand at the end of El Camino Real. Mm -hmm. In my California, we know heathen Chinese. We know Hollywood starlet. We know there is there. We know pesticide water. We know Mojave rattlesnake. We truck in hard down the grapevine. We charge in SUVs up the Altamont Pass. In my California, we know how to party. We black hand the party. We Tupac and Dre. We dime a day. We dollar a dance. We fill more jazz. We summer of love. We Barbary Coast. We I Hotel. We Chinatown. We North Beach Howl. In my California, we know Baywatch, babe. We East Los. We South Central LA. We Rodney King Video. We Campesino. We mighty Sacramento River. Rooted deep sequoia giants. We love in the wind. Kiss in the sky. Okay, and actually, I will end with um, another poem that I had written after Kevin A. Gonzalez's poem, The Night Tito Trinidad KO'd Ricardo Mayorga. And I think you know this poem, Richard. This is The Night Manny Pacquiao KO'd Oscar De La Hoya. Okay. I've heard you that. I know, I know. <laughs> but he's so great. <laughs> the Night Manny Pacquiao KO'd Oscar De La Hoya. The senator embraced his toddler's yaya and shared a San Miguel beer in the spit shine polished banquet room. How else could it have gone down? They spit in our face, Filipinos. They fuck us, and when we come home, they treat us like maids. We stink of garlic and barbecued dog. Our dignity is as a stick as the glaring eyes of our Pinoy boxers. I am writing this poem because I am you, you know. I am you, and pride makes necessary things even more necessary and beautiful. Because the muscle of punches has forced our presence into news newspapers, and our anthem is amplified by the glitz of Las Vegas. Our culture is an advertisement for Nike, kneeling at the corner post, and the jeepney driver fist pumping, war cry reach in heaven, hands clenched and rosaried for the two saviors that we worship. Thank you very much.